I'm going to share with you the breakdown of the three stages of vegetable fermentation so that you can be a better and more confident fermenter. Vegetable fermentations, including sauerkraut, are a type of fermentation called lactic acid fermentation, or also referred to as lacto-fermentation. There are several key characteristics of a vegetable lactic acid fermentation. One, they're anaerobic, meaning the fermentation must take place in an oxygen-free environment, typically beneath a saltwater brine. Two, they're acidic, meaning the pH will drop below a 4.5 on the pH scale. Three, they're rich in probiotics, meaning those beneficial bacteria that are good for our digestive and immune systems. These key characteristics of lactic acid fermentation follow three successive microbial stages. Keep in mind these stages do not transition from one to the next with a hard line, such as stage one start stop, stage two start stop, etc. Rather, they overlap each other by phasing in and phasing out. Stage one, days zero to two-ish, becoming anaerobic. Sauerkraut and other vegetables to be fermented are submerged beneath a salt brine, which initiates the needed anaerobic environment. The kraut or the vegetables are typically packed into the jar very tightly as to push most of the visual remaining air pockets out. However, microscopic air pockets still exist beneath the brine during this early stage, thus giving way to the oxygen utilizing microbes that will thrive first. Typically, these microbes are the unwanted pathogens, and although they are the first to thrive, they're also going to be the first to die off. Since these unwanted pathogens are aerobic, meaning they require oxygen in order to survive and thrive, they're going to use up the remaining air in the jar that's tucked in the vegetables, nooks and crannies beneath the brine. They will use up the oxygen to their own peril. With all of the air gone, the environment is altered from aerobic to anaerobic, and they can no longer survive. Additionally, the salt content of the brine leads to their demise due to them not being salt tolerant. As these pathogens die off, they give rise to the next stage of fermentation. Stage two, days two through five-ish, becoming bubbly and acidic. Leuconostoc bacteria is the next microbe genus to thrive in the stages of fermentation. Leuconostoc is anaerobic and salt tolerant, unlike the pathogens. Leuconostoc produces two types of acid, lactic acid and acetic acid. These acids rapidly lower the pH, which contributes to the die-off of unwanted pathogens. Usually, you see this dramatic pH drop within the first couple of days. You can see here in this chart the pH drop of my white kimchi. As you can see, the most dramatic drop is within the first couple of days, stage two, the kickoff period of fermentation. The carbon dioxide byproduct of the leuconostoc, as well as some yeasts, produce the fervent bubbles that stage two fermentation is most known for. The carbon dioxide also pushes up the brine, and sometimes that will cause an overflow, which is why it's a good idea to set your jars on a towel or in or on a dish to catch any overflowing brine. The CO2 stimulates the growth of many lactic acid bacteria, aka probiotics, cultivating the environment for stage 3. Speaking of environment, although the leucon and stock bacteria of this stage are good microbes, in their thriving period, their lactic and acetic acid byproducts create the environment to be too acidic for their continued survival. They soon begin to die off as the fermentation progresses into stage three. Here's a visual example of my white kimchi. This is day zero and the kimchi has just been made. Take note of the brine level and the vegetables are down to the bottom of the jar. Here it is on day three. The brine level is significantly higher. It did overflow a bit, and the CO2 has pushed the vegetables up. You can see lots of CO2 bubbles that have formed, especially when the contents are pushed down. 
Just an added note here, to prevent the push-up of the vegetables during this stage, a fermentation weight is used. However, the example of the white kimchi that I just showed you is an exception to the fermentation weight rule. Because Korean kimchi is made with a different technique than classic sauerkraut and other standard vegetable ferments. I explain more in my white kimchi video. Nonetheless, all lacto fermentations go through these same three stages. Stage three, days five and onward, probiotic and nutritive development. By this stage, the fermenting environment has been altered to give rise to the bacteria genus called lactobacillus. This genus is what constitutes most commercial probiotic capsules and is best known for their role in beneficial, healthy digestion. They are anaerobic, salt tolerant, and acid tolerant, which is why they're going to thrive for the remainder of the fermentation. The lactobacillus will also outcompete other remaining microbes as they thrive in this anaerobic, salty, acidic environment. Unlike leuconostac bacteria from stage two, lactobacillus excrete only one type of acid, lactic acid. This acid production will continue to drop the pH. A pH below 4.5 is what I call the safety zone because a pH below 4.5 is acidic enough to kill off unwanted pathogens. Even more so, I preferably like to see a pH between 3 and 4.0 as an even heartier pH for mature ferments. With this genus, the species L. brevis, L standing for lactobacillus, L. plantarum, and sometimes this guy, are the first to make an appearance in stage three. Here are other beneficial species found in fermented foods. Of course, not limiting to. So are all of those in every sauerkraut or vegetable fermentation? No, they're not. And I explain the why and the how of varying probiotic profiles in this video here called 12 Essential Probiotics. I'll place the link in the description. Please do check it out. Let's return to the white kimchi example. Here it is on day seven as it has transitioned from stage two into stage three. The brine level has fallen, the vegetables are no longer being pushed up, there are few to no bubbles, and it has become sufficiently acidic. Although the fermentation has entered into stage three, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's reached its full maturity. These beneficial microbial species continue to be successive as they alter the environment to the point where they can no longer thrive, but that same environment is now perfect for the next species group to thrive. This microbial succession will continue until the fermentation has reached the end of the road. In my fermentation funk series, I show a couple examples of a sauerkraut that has indeed reached the end of its road. I explain further the conditions and the time period it took for that to happen in that video. I'll place a link in the video description. In this stage, lactobacillus also create the nutrients such as GABA, B vitamins, enzymes, polyphenols, and as well as increase the bioavailability of other vitamins and minerals already present in the vegetables. This is one of the greatest benefits of a mature lactic acid fermentation. Mature meaning it's had adequate time to reach full development of stage three. This typically takes 20 to 30 days. The question may arise, can you eat the fermentation sooner or do you have to wait for the full maturity cycle before eating it? Well, depending on who you ask, the answer will vary. Some fermenters are very hard-lined and say it's a waste of time to eat a fermentation before a minimum of 14 days or even longer. Other experienced fermenters like Sandor Katz have a different point of view. Sandor says eating it at different stages is a great way to ingest biodiversity because you're getting different bacterial strains at different stages of the process. He says, I once had an Austrian woman taste my two-month-old sauerkraut and tell me it was very good for coleslaw. To her Austrian palate, my two-month-old sauerkraut was not mature enough to be called sauerkraut. 
And then I've had the contrast experience of feeding people three-day-old sauerkraut because I ran out of sauerkraut on my book tour and all these people said, this is the best sauerkraut I've ever had in my life. There's no virtue waiting for six weeks if you're going to prefer it in six days. I agree with Sander on this one and believe there is a place for both short-term and long-term fermentations. Personally, I eat both kinds. I have short-term fermentations that are days old and long-term fermentations that are weeks to even many months old. At the end of the day, it's personal preference. It's important to note the role of environmental temperature and what types of vegetables and or fruits are in the ferment, for they affect the timing of the fermentation stages. Fermenting below 70 degrees slows the fermentation process down. Fermenting in an environment between 70 and 80 degrees is considered standard and is what the schedule of stages one through three are based on in this video. The addition of fruits or other types of sugars like honey to the fermentation will also speed up the fermentation rate since those natural sugars provide a greater amount of fuel for the lactobacillus to proliferate and do their thing. Now, fermenting above 80 degrees, even more so above 90, will affect the fermentation speed so greatly that the process of bacterial succession can actually be altered. Want to learn more about fermentation? I've got a whole playlist of fermenting education right here, including five different types of fermentation, since they're not all the same. I've got a playlist of fermenting recipes right here, and of course, all the links are in the description. I'll see you again soon. Bye for now.